While the government tries to hide the consequences of inflation in their official statistics, Americans see and feel it every day. Join the Mises Institute in Tampa on February 17th for our first event of 2024. We'll discuss inflation, its causes, consequences, and cure. Tom DiLorenzo, Joe Salerno, and Patrick Newman will uncover the state's deceit to reveal inflation for what it really is, deliberate debasement of the dollar to create winners and losers. Sign up now at Mises.org slash Tampa 2024 and use code ACTION24 for 15% off admission. What is the state? How does it preserve itself? What does it fear? These are the questions Murray Rothbard uncovers in his powerful book, Anatomy of the State. Thanks to our generous donors, the Mises Institute is offering a free copy of this Rothbard classic to Human Action Podcast listeners. Get your copy at Mises.org slash H-A-Pod free. That's H-A, like human action, pod free. This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Tyler, welcome to the Human Action Podcast. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me on, Bob. So the topic of today is going to be your book, trying to determine or at least give the framework by which one might evaluate and determine who is the GOAT in economics. So can you first explain what that acronym means for those who don't know, and then what made you pick this topic to write a book on? GOAT is an acronym that I believe comes from sports, most commonly from the NBA, and it stands for greatest of all time. Who is the greatest of all time? So being a fan of economics, I wanted to write this book from the point of view of a fan and ask the question, who's the greatest economist of all time? And that's the origin of the book. Okay. And as you said, it's was it partly because you you weren't sure yourself how you felt about it? And so you thought, well, I need to write a book in order to flesh out my views? And I'm still not sure who's the greatest economist of all time. I think it's a deeply complex project, and one never quite settles on a right answer. And that, to me, makes it more appealing. Yeah, so I heard you, I think it was on Russ Roberts' uh, show, but where, yeah, we, we're leaving the mystery open to the listeners. Like we want them to go read your book. So we won't say how, how Tyler wraps up the analysis. And I should also say folks, there, it's a, a very, uh, there's a lot of material in the book. And so what is going to happen here, by no means am I going to basically have Tyler summarize the whole book. I'm just going to go through as we get into this and just grab things that caught my eye and have him respond. So to, and also we're going to, of course, cater this, make this cater to, uh, an Austrian audience, since that's what this this podcast is for. Be, before, sure, we, let me just say the book is free and online. And if you Google Tyler Cowan Goat, you get right to it. Yes. So you can just download it, put it on your Kindle. Uh, you can read it through uh, GPT four as you wish. So that that was one thing. The the artificial intelligence angle. Before we get into the content of the economic discussion, can you just explain a little bit? You know, you I guess you partly wrote it with the assistance of it, but also the AI is there to help you study the book? Can you explain about that? I wrote the book completely myself, Mm -hmm. and I wrote virtually all of it before GPT-4 was even on the market. But you can read the book through GPT-4. And what that means is, well, one way to read the book is just read it like you read a normal book. Or you can open up an app we give the reader for free and just start asking questions about the book. Like, what does Tyler think was Adam Smith's greatest contribution? Or what does Tyler see as the greatest flaw in John Maynard Keynes? Or what would Paul Krugman say about this chapter? Or if you don't want to read the chapter on Malthus, just ask it. Summarize this chapter for me. So that's an extra option you have. But again, you can just read it without the AI. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Now, one thing that surprised me early on when you were just sort of giving the background and how you got into this is just uh, you, you had a little story about that you went to uh, the phone, bo- phone booths in New York City and you, you looked at the, uh, the entry for what, where the local bookstores were and you would just rip those pages out. This would be like Wilmington or Philadelphia because New York City, we knew how to get around. Oh, okay. We knew where the stores were. But if you're in Wilmington for the day looking for used bookstores, right? there's no internet, you can't Google anything. Mm-hmm. So you would look for a Yellow Pages. 
Okay. And that you and then you just you ripped the pages out. I was just surprised. I didn't know you were that such was a, wrong. I didn't right? know you're such a aggression. naughty boy. That's that was the point. That that's that's when you were in your hell raising youth. But that's the worst thing I ever did in my hell raising youth. I okay. can tell you that. <laughs> okay. Well, wh- why don't we again? I want we're going to get into your stuff in a second. But the elephant in the room for this podcast, you know, tied to the Mises Institute is Tyler. How come not only did Mises not make your short list, but you didn't have an explanation as to why he didn't make the short list? Well, I think Mises would be one of the 15 or 20 greatest economists of all time. Mm -hmm. Uh, Marx is another person I don't consider. Uh, I actually thought then and still now that I will write separate shorter monographs on both Mises and Marx, that they were better better handled in standalone form. Uh, But Mises doesn't make the short list because I don't think he's GOAT, essentially. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big admirer of his books, uh, Socialism and Liberalism. A uh, theory of money and credit, I think, is a quite good tract on monetary economics. Uh, but I don't think he is as sharp an economic reasoner as, say, either Milton Friedman or Friedrich Hayek. Okay. And he doesn't have the firstness of, say, Adam Smith. Okay. So I guess w- w- I was thinking in terms of, like his contributions that to me. Well, for one thing, let me say this, and then you tell me if you think I'm wrong. So I th- think that he was the one who really showed how the subjective marginal utility approach could handle money. Whereas I think before him, they, they thought that, no, there was a circular, you know, regress in that. And that Mises was the one to show that, no, you, you, we can apply this new subjective value theory, even to money. Are you okay with my claim there? Well, I don't think that makes him goat, but if you're asking me, do I think we need Mises's regression theorem uh, to solve for a value of money? I don't think we do. Uh, I think it's an interesting hypothesis about how expectations were formed. It's a real contribution, but I don't think there was a circularity problem to begin with. Once you stop confusing like movements of supply and demand curves and shifts along the curves, I think there's just broadly speaking an equilibrium in that market and there's a value of money, especially if government accepts it for payment of taxes. Okay. uh, Let me, let me try one more. I, this is not because I'm disagreeing with you, Tyler, but I just want us to be clarifying our views for the listener. Sure. So yeah, so here, I'm not saying it doesn't this make him goat. I just meant when I was, because you, because you're among your criteria, like originality and like what new things did they bring to the table? This is what I have always filed away. Like, yes, I love Mises. I love human action. But in terms of just as an economic scholar, as a thinker, did he actually bring anything to economic science? One of the things I had filed away was that, Using the sub- subjective value theory, you know, from 1871 onward, the way economists eventually would describe like a barter equilibrium in terms of subjective valuation, there definitely was a strain of thought that said, however, you can't use this new framework for money because you just end up arguing in a circle that you're saying, oh, why does somebody accept money in exchange? It's because, oh, well, you subjectively value it more than the thing you gave up. But why do you subjectively value it? Well, because it has purchasing power. And so it sure. looked like so it looked like you were explaining the purchasing power of money by reference to the purchasing power of money, which is moving in a circle. So what Mises did is he said, "No, you got to bring in the time element." Today's purchasing power was formed from ex- about expectations of you know imminent purchasing power, and that so for, forget like tying it back to sure. gold and silver, but just like the idea of bringing the time to show it's not a circular argument. At best, it's an infinite regress, but it's not circular. Yeah, that's a contribution. I think his biggest contribution is the 1920 article Mm -hmm. showing that economic calculation under true socialism is impossible. Okay, so that that was going to be the other one I was going to say. Sure, and that's by far his biggest single thing. Uh, But again, the books Socialism and Liberalism are maybe what I today find most interesting in Mises. Mm -hmm. I think they've held up very well. And what he thought was wrong with those systems, it's not just technically correct but he fixed on a lot of the most relevant and interesting points. And he had this big picture thinking. Mm -hmm. Uh, Those are probably, you know, still the best books on their topics. Okay. And then one last thing on Mises and then I'll move on is another big one in my book is uh, his explanation of the business cycle. Now I'm guessing is partly why to you, that's not another reason that maybe he's a goat is because you actually don't think that's, I know you've written criticisms of what's called Austrian business cycle theory. So am I right? on that score? That's right. I think Mises extends the 19th century theory of the credit cycle, which to me is a contribution. But that said, I don't think he or Hayek, for that matter, 
ever explained why in the data, consumer and investment goods sectors just tend to go up and go down together rather mm -hmm. than seeing shifts from one to the other. So I don't think the theory succeeded as stated, uh, but it was a good extension of a 19th century theory. I think Mises himself viewed it as such. Uh, I would count it as a contribution. I think there's probably some modified version of the theory that will in fact explain some sub-segment of business cycles. So that counts for something for me. Okay. Uh, you know, I meant to ask you before we got going here, can you just for the listener with, with this crowd, probably this goes without saying, but I'm just curious, especially if there's listeners who are themselves professors and trying to get their students to understand there's a, a strain in economics of saying all the important discoveries and knowledge of the past has been, you know, brought forward in the cutting edge approaches. There's no reason to read history of economic thought unless it just interests you, but there's no real reason you know, physicists don't go read stuff that Isaac Newton wrote. You know, they might take F equals MA and that kind of stuff, but we don't go read it in his work. So why the heck would I waste my time going and reading some of these classics if I just want to do good economics? Do you want to respond to that sort of position? The best classic writers were just better, deeper, and broader thinkers than most, maybe all current economists. So it depends what you're interested in. If you're just doing statistical estimation, even then you might want to read them to get a sense of what the important questions are. But if you want to understand your world, have a better sense of policy, of course you need to read them. If you don't read them, I would just say you're not really literate in economics. You know, Florian Aderer, the economist, he said today on Twitter, you know, no one should read these old books. People are debating this on Twitter as we're recording. I just think that's so wrong. And it's, it's wrong about Mises and Hayek. But even the economist you might like much less, you know, Marx, mm -hmm. Keynes, whatever, uh, they're very insightful and smart, even if you don't like all the conclusions. Yeah, for me, it's much more intellectually satisfying to read like Bombavrik, in my mind, dismantle Marxist theory of surplus value as opposed to listing all the thousands and millions of people that died under communism as a, you know, as a refutation of Marx. Like to me, the grappling with his theories of the market is is much more interesting. I agree. And I would add, I don't know of a newer treatment that does it better than Bombevik did. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's one I don't know about, but he's very thorough. Uh, the quality of the reasoning is very high. He hits on the right points. And he, you know, to my mind, just destroys the labor theory of value mm -hmm. and the concomitant theory of labor being exploited. Okay, one other one I want to ask as to why didn't this person get in that might surprise some of our listeners, but what about Irving Fisher? Couldn't he plausibly have been somebody that you should have given more attention to? Uh, I think so. Uh, you know, I could have given more attention to Kenneth Arrow. William Stanley Jevons, I think, is mm -hmm. quite underrated. There's also Carl Menger. Uh, I just had to draw a line to make the book a book. So it's about 100,000 words, okay. mm -hmm. which is fairly long. I can say I'm going to write more in these areas and cover some of these individuals at greater length. Mm -hmm. So uh, I picked people that I thought readers wanted to read about and who were plausible candidates. Uh, but Menger, Jevons, Fisher, possibly Schumpeter, who is mentioned, but not, not for mm -hmm. so long. Well, Arrow, you uh, do explain why Arrow didn't make the short list. That's what I'm saying. That Yeah. Okay. But uh, Arrow, I feel, is the strongest of the people I put in the queue and who didn't make it. Right. Okay. And just for the listener, I know you know this, Tyler, but the reason I, like, I personally have an affinity for Fisher is a lot of people might think, oh, quantity theory of money. And, and yeah, but that's not why his work on interest theory, like when I was teaching at Hillsdale, a history of thought class, I spent three lectures just going through, you know, excerpts and explain what he did just because not, not for the his, history of economic thought purposes, but just to really get across in, you know, the, the essentials of how to think about intertemporal transfers of goods and things, because I just thought he, he nailed it so well that, uh, anyway, so I, and I he understood stocks and flows so well, right. Yeah. He mm -hmm. also invented the Rolodex and he wrote on nutrition and, and alcohol. He was a very interesting guy, uh, too much a progressive for my taste. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he thought about social matters at a very general and deep level. Okay. So now let's move into the, uh, well, let, let's do a quick one on Arrow. So Arrow in your framework, he didn't make the short list, but he was, a someone you had to explain why he didn't make the short list. So can you just give us your reactions on him? He was a very brilliant man and a deep theorist. 
Ultimately, I don't feel that general equilibrium theory is the way economics either did go or should have gone. Uh, but for, for many people, especially theorists, it's a very, very important contribution. And the, the underlying theories of how we price securities, which prove themselves every day in the financial markets, uh, those really come from Arrow and his work in the mid-60s. Mm -hmm. And that's very, very important. Uh, not enough to make him go, but I feel I didn't quite give it enough attention in the book, and I might in the future. Mm -hmm. Now, you did have a line in there that surprised me about him, because for me, the, the reason, I, again, I have an affinity for him, again, might surprise some of our listeners, is his uh, imp impossibility theorem. You can actually prove that. to If you have someone who's willing to give you a half an hour, they need to have no prior knowledge of set theory or anything. And you can sit there and prove. I think it was Amartya Sen actually came up with the way to prove it that I ended up using in my classes. Uh, you know, like an easier way to, to do his, uh, you know, with some lemmas and stuff that made the whole thing pretty, like with little subroutines, as it were, to prove it. But it was, to me, it was an astonishing result. Just like you would not have thought looking at the axioms that the conclusion, there is no social welfare function that obeys all these axioms. To me, that's jaw dropping. Um, and yet you seem to say that like, yeah, it's a, it's a good result, but it's not really a big deal. Or, or I, I don't remember your exact words, but do you want to just react to that? I now view the impossibility theorem as less important than I first thought. My actual worry with many democracies is just how poorly informed voters are, not some intrinsic underlying technical difficulty of having fully consistent voting rules. So majority rule in some way with division of powers is what most countries do. What's the actual problem? It's not procedural. I would say it's the quality of the voter inputs. Okay. All right. Is that analogous? If we wanted to draw an analogy to like the the critiques of socialism, what Arrow's doing there maybe is more analogous to like Mises saying just in general, it's impossible to have calculation, but someone might say, okay, sure, maybe, but the real issue with communism is like the abuse of power or the incentives exactly. are all wrong. Is that is that a good exactly. analogy? Okay. And I think that is a limitation on Mises's argument. I don't think Mises would have disagreed with what you just said, mm -hmm. but the, the planners, they're not really trying to calculate an optimum to begin with. They're trying to exercise power and right. seize rents for themselves. Mm -hmm. So you don't even get to the impossibility of calculation mattering that much. Yeah, right. It's more like someone with that much power might start murdering their rivals as opposed to, you know, how can you be sure that the tangency between the <laughs> We're the just keeping lines. the prices yeah. of goods too low to create shortages. Mm -hmm. So there's a queue. And you can give away the meat, you know, for favors or bribes. Right. Okay. So in a funny way, the people in the shops could calculate the price. Like the price of meat in the Soviet Union, it was always too low. It was never too high. There was something they did calculate, right? They knew mm -hmm. to set it too low to take in bribes and be corrupt. Okay. All right. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's that's maybe a good way to put it. So that's, so again, just so we're not losing people, your point is, yes, Mises general observations, like even stipulating that the planners want nothing but the best for their people and they have all the technical knowledge and da, 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 da. Still, there's this insurmountable in Mises view gap um, if, you don't, if you're not guided by genuine market prices for capital goods. But your point is in practice, they never got there, that they were already deviating from the assumptions of the exercise and that was leading to problems. Sure. And in Mises' book, Socialism, he clearly shows he understood that bigger picture. Okay. All right, so why don't we now move into the people that are on your short list? Uh, so for this podcast, obviously Hayek is one of the the contenders that you spend you know a chapter on. So do you want to just give your broad remarks, and then maybe I'll I'll ask you to elaborate on some of them. Well, his most important and best known articles, such as Use of Knowledge in Society, which you could read online, I think is the greatest article in, of economics of all time. So that alone makes him a serious contender. Mm -hmm. The way prices allocate resources, mobilize decentralized or even inarticulable knowledge in the marketplace, that's just a phenomenal piece. It's the best thing we economists have done. What, what's funny about that, Tyler, is uh, when I was in grad school at NYU, like maybe my second or third year, so I was there, you know, it was, it was in the regular program, but it was on an Austrian fellowship. So every Monday there'd be the colloquium that I would go to as, you know, as a grad student. And some of my peers in the program with me, what were asking me like once in a while, like, what, what is this Austrian stuff? And so one of the guys, he was this guy from Japan, very good at math. So like he was one of our best, you know, if you had trouble with the problem set, you might go ask him for help with that guy. 
And so I, he wanted to know about Austrian economics. I, so I asked him or I you know, emailed him Hayek's use of knowledge in society and said, start with that. And he came back a couple of days later. So I tried to read this and I didn't understand. I don't even know what he's talking about. So like that really underscored for me the gap between, you know, his studying of mathematical models and determining equilibria versus what Hayek was saying about how markets work. And now he could ask ChatGPT to explain it to him through my book if he wants to, right? Yeah. So that's one of the innovations uh -huh. of the book. If there's any part of it you don't understand, just ask the AI and it will tell you things that I don't. You can even ask the AI, well, if Tyler put Mises in the book, what would he have said about Mises? The answers mm -hmm. are not so bad. Okay, yeah. And, and by the way, I also, Tyler, think people are underrating chat GPT-4 that I've been telling people, you got to check this thing out. You can't believe the capabilities of this. Like you can have real conversations with it. Um, Okay. What, a, uh, so just again, going back to Hayek. So you think that he, it wasn't just that that was the best one. Didn't you say something like his, his three, was it his three are better than any other three from any other single economist? Is that the, the different way? way yeah. Different ways you can tally them up, but uh -huh. competition as a discovery procedure is one of the best articles of all time. Maybe the second best and Hayek's peaks are very, very strong. I'm not sure about the overall quality of his contributions. Mm -hmm. So unlike some Austrians, I don't think Constitution of Liberty is a great book. Murray Rothbard wrote a long critique of it, I think in the early 60s, mm -hmm. maybe the late 50s. And a lot of Rothbard's critiques, Ron Hamowy's critiques, I think were correct. So Hayek's big masterwork, it's, it's a good and interesting book. I don't think it's a great book. And Hayek got obsessed with a number of normative questions where he never was willing to either go for a rights theory or be a utilitarian. And he would have been better in either direction. And it became this rather soggy mess that just got more and more complicated. And in my view, he never succeeded in resolving. But again, he's clearly a contender for GOAT. Mm -hmm. The yeah. best stuff is incredible. Right. Okay. Let's move on to Keynes. So he, you said, again, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but something along the lines of like, if you... If you were going to go out to dinner with any economist from the list, it would have been Keynes or something like that. Am I getting it right? It seems like he was the most fun. So mm -hmm. other people who wrote about Keynes, including Hayek, by the way, they seemed to really like him. And he was very charming, very well-educated, mm -hmm. had an interest in the arts and music. The Bloomsbury Circle people wanted to hang around with him. So, of course, I've never met Keynes. And reminiscences can be misleading when it's a powerful man. But it does seem like he was a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah, you had, can you speak a little bit? There's something that wasn't on my radar. Uh, you said he was part of this group called the Apostles. Can you just speak a little bit about that? They were a Cambridge group, you know, earlier part of the 20th century. They were in a way like today's rationality community. They were obsessed with using one particular notion of reason to evaluate and improve everything in human life, uh, a practice Hayek objected to greatly. And I think they overreached. They uh, did not have enough epistemic humility. They thought they could sit down, figure out how everything ought to be, which included them as the planners. And that, in my view, was a mistake. It was a, a detour. And it led Keynes and many of the others astray on many issues. So uh, it was really a, f a fundamental error and I think behind everything they did, even though they were brilliant, Bertrand Russell ha has some of the same problems. So overestimating the powers of the individual human mind and underestimating the powers of decentralized mechanisms. Uh, and you soon after you bring that up, you mentioned how Keynes himself admitted that at least for a period, this group, they viewed Christianity as the enemy. It, was the term apostles like tongue in cheek or, or not? It's a good question. Uh, I suspect it was tongue-in-cheek. Uh, I, I don't know that I know. Okay. I think for a, a, they didn't stop viewing Christianity as the enemy. I think they grew to accept it. They realized it wasn't going away. Though today in Britain, the percentage of people who go to church seems to be below 5%, I believe. So in that sense, it's gone away. Maybe Christian modes of thought have not vanished. Uh, mm -hmm. But Keynes in particular, as we know, he was gay. And the Christian church, Anglican church, was a strong opponent of having a gay life or being mm -hmm. gay. Mm -hmm. And he, he resented that. On that, he was clearly correct. So the rationalism 
say, the view that we should tolerate people with different sexual preferences, on that, the rationalism completely got it right. But in the realm of politics, it became more problematic. Okay. Uh, oh, so I'm glad you clarified, because, yeah, I know you said something, but you mean, at that point, saying we viewed Christianity as not because later they came to be happy with it. It was just that, you know, they thought, okay, well, it's, it's sticking here, so let's move on with our lives. Okay. And they became more small C conservative as they aged, like like right. most people do. Right. Okay, you had an interesting line in here that let me actually read it and then have you explain it. So you, you're you, in this your treatment of Keynes, you spend a lot of time on what people might think of as his non economic writings, and then you explain that by saying, if you want to understand the general theory and the rest of Keynes's corpus, think of them as Keynes trying to fill in the blanks. So that this broader vision, which you know you had just summarized, can be realized, and to create the politics and economic policy machinery to keep it on track, that is what Keynes was all about, and that is why I'm so emphasizing his broader social and political thought. The economics was a kind of detail. So can you just elaborate on that? Well, Keynes is having the central part of his career at a time when communism is very much on the rise, it's a real threat, and fascism is very much on the rise. And Keynes, to his credit, was strongly opposed to both of those. Uh, and he wanted to preserve some kind of British liberalism, not our classical liberalism, uh, not exactly the modern liberalism either, but some notion of Britain as, as a world power with an empire, maybe in decline, but still making possible this kind of reasoned life where you talked about ideas with your friends. Uh, there was a fair amount of tolerance. Something about British traditions could continue within a framework that was neither, you know, fascism nor communism. And I think that's what motivated him. And, well, you needed good economic policy to get there. You can debate whether Keynes got the policy issues right. But I think that's why he cared about economics. He wanted to preserve this particular world he had grown up in. And in that sense, he's very small C conservative. And then maybe the last thing on Keynes before we move on. Near the end there, you have a little subsection that says, does Keynes need to be canceled? And you go through, and he has some inflammatory quotes such that if it was a more right-wing conservative economist who had said that, probably some of their detractors nowadays would bring that stuff up a lot. And yet you don't see leftist progressives talking about uh, you know some of these difficult quotes from Keynes. Do you want to comment on that? Well, Keynes was clearly anti-Semitic. And for, what, eight years, he was president of the Eugenics Society in Britain. And it wasn't just about birth control. It was about actual active eugenics. So I don't want to cancel Keynes for those things. But the notion that this overly rationalistic, progressive approach to economics is going to pick up a lot of other negative baggage along the way, because you think, you know, your mind can figure everything out. Uh, that's a way of seeing that Keynes's errors, they, they popped up in these other areas. So, you know, the, those are strikes against him intellectually. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so actually, I, I realized I was going through my notes here in your manuscript. There was some, going back to Hayek, you have a, a personal anecdote here where you say, you were in the room with him, and you say, I recall asking him a question, and then Hayek was saying in response that he was planning to write a sequel volume to his 1941 Pure Theory of Capital, um, because that had dealt with, you know, the real economy, and then he was going to add money. So I had always heard that Hayek intended to write a sequel to the pure theory of capital. So the pure meaning, you know, there's no money in it. Right. And then he just, you know, got, my joke was he, that was so hard. He decided to go talk about the nervous system as an easier thing to write on. But do we know that from your question or has he, did he elsewhere say that to people that, oh yeah, I meant to write a sequel. And then he just never did. It is known from Hayek's biography that at the time he meant to write a sequel, but he started thinking about his earlier review of Keynes's treatise on money, mm -hmm. which turned out not to matter because Keynes himself repudiated the treatise. Uh, there's the World War, post-war reconstruction, and Hayek just thought at the time the moment had passed and to try to rebuild the theory of capital integrated with money. It wasn't going to get him anywhere. He instead is writing The Road to Serfdom, which is a bestseller. I'm very glad he made that switch. Wrote to Serfdom was a highly influential uh, and great positive book. Uh, but then this is now Hayek well into his 80s saying he wants to go back to the project. And I thought that wasn't realistic of him. 
you know, that a man well into his 80s would think he had the intellectual equipment, energy to integrate theory of money and capital. Basically, this is 40 years after it had once been an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, showed, you know, maybe Hayek was a bit too rationalistic in his own particular way, overrating the powers of his individual mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. I know. I'm and no one's ever succeeded at that project. There was once talk Roger Garrison would do it. You know, I liked Roger's piece on Austrian macro, but no one really came up with the, the book that was going to do that. I don't really think it's possible. It's maybe too complex a problem. We're going to go off on a tangent here, but what do you think, Tyler, about um, the possibility of, of doing like computers, especially talking about AI and whatever, what about doing now a pretty sophisticated simulation of the economy and trying to, like, would you personally be interested in something like that, that kind of did a simulated economy? And what if you could get an Austrian business cycle to happen in a world like that? Would that do anything for you? Or I think we're far from that with current AI. It's not designed for that purpose. What I think current AI can do and people will use it for once there's greater confidentiality is you'll feed in all the documents from your business or maybe even recorded meetings, send it to the AI and ask the AI, what improvements could we make? Mm -hmm. And I think it will do a very good job at that. But a whole economy, no, we're not there yet. I don't think we're close. Okay. It also, just again, for the listeners, don't miss it. I'm not saying we can plan an economy with supercomputers. That's not what I'm saying. I've explicitly written against that. What I'm saying, though, is instead of economists on paper trying to write little models and things and write books on it, you know, maybe we could do a simulation. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I'm looking at the clock here. I want to get a couple more in here. What about Malthus? So, he, Tyler, if anyone even knows who Malthus is nowadays, 99.9% .9 will say, oh, yeah, he was the guy that thought everyone was going to starve to death, and he's the hero of modern environmentalism. It's completely antithetical to free markets, and, you know, real economists know the resources are not finite or at least not in a meaningful, economically meaningful sense. If we need more oil, we go find it. If you need to feed more people, you come up with innovations in agriculture. And, you know, Malthusian is a pejorative term now in the free market camp. And yet you're saying Malthus arguably could be the greatest economist of all time. So tell us what's what, how we're thinking about it wrong. Most people misread Malthus. To be clear, Malthus is not my candidate for GOAT, but he's considerably underrated. He was a, largely a classical liberal in his time. He understood full well that agricultural productivity could go up, that birth control was possible. But he was, you know, a reverend and he, a preacher, he was afraid that the world that would result from all that birth control would be completely depraved, a bit like a London brothel writ large. Now, I think he was quite wrong about that. I'm not myself religious or Christian, uh, but he's not an out and out pessimist. He was a very deep thinker. Uh, but of all the people I consider on my short list, I do think he comes in last. So he, he was wrong about his ultimate fundamentals, but he wasn't wrong in the way that most people think. Okay. So are the following correct that you think he, as an economist, he was a lot more than just the essay on population and, al and, and also the, but, the popular distillation of what he was trying to do in that essay is a crude mischaracterization, even though probably he is wrong in what he said in that essay. Is that fair? Yes. And you have to distinguish between editions. The first edition of Malthus's essay, it is pretty crude. Mm -hmm. The third edition is quite sophisticated. So he improved a lot, which I give him credit for. Uh, okay. But at the end of the day, uh, Malthus isn't the person you read if you want to understand the rest of the 19th century. Let's put it that way. Okay. Okay, I'm looking at the clock. We got about five minutes here before we have our stop. Let's end it out with Milton Friedman. So first, do you want to make the case for why he's, you know, a, a contender for GOAT? And then maybe I'll ask you some specifics. Well, he did both micro and macro. He did both theory and empirical work. He's to this day super influential on monetary economics. He, along with Hayek, was one of the two major figures leading to market-oriented reforms and also encouraging people to dump communism and move to systems like what we see in Poland today. So in terms of influence, doctrine, he has a very strong case. Mm -hmm. And you were stressing like he's both a, uh, you know, a well-published scholar with cutting-edge research, but also, 
you know, a very a, a public communicator. So he's he kind of checked all those boxes. And he was right about many, many issues. Uh, I never agreed with him about money growth rules. Mm -hmm. But overall, Friedman was far, far more right than he was wrong. For people who don't realize that, yeah, he was far more than just, you know, a glib guy arguing with Phil Donahue about greed or something. Um, you mentioned his 48 piece with Savage on expected utility theory. Like, so that's pretty highbrow stuff. Can you just explain what that is for the listeners who don't know about that re result? Well, there was a paradox. It's still in the world. Why is it the sa that the same people both buy insurance and purchase lottery tickets? If they're risk averse, they would buy the insurance, but not buy the tickets. If they're risk loving, they would buy the tickets, but not the insurance. And Friedman Savage had a very particular hypothesis as to the shape of the utility function. I don't think that particular piece has held up as completely true, but they understood a puzzle. They tried to answer it. They tried to have an answer that would have other empirical implications. It was a big advance in the debate at its time, and it's deservedly a famous article. What about uh, the permanent income hypothesis? Can you explain what that is? Well, this is Friedman revising Keynes, and on this, Friedman was mostly correct and Keynes was mostly wrong. So in simple Keynesian models, including in the general theory, consumption is determined by current income. And Friedman, drawing on Irving Fisher, pointed out, well, there's stocks and flows. You also care about your wealth and what your income is going to be across the rest of your life. You can use the phrase permanent income as a proxy for those broader considerations. And if you take that into account, Friedman predicted after World War II, there would not be a recession. The Keynesians were all terrified that after World War II, there would be a recession. It because of the Friedman, drop in government spending? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it turned out Friedman clearly was correct. It may be relevant to inflation falling in 2023 without a recession. And it's one of the most important ideas in macro. Friedman with Irving Fisher gets credit. And again, people still are using Friedman's framework to this day. It's a big contribution. Okay, great. And then maybe the last thing about him, and then we'll just kind of wrap up, is can you talk something that, so that, as you know, Tyler, there are a lot of libertarian economists, particularly if they're fans of the Austrian school, and they bristle at Milton Friedman, perhaps thinking, you know, oh, he gets too much credit, Rothbard was better, that sort of thing. But something that I think everyone should be able to agree on in that camp is Friedman should be credited for his work against the military draft. So can you just talk about that? Well, Friedman led a commission that issued a report explaining why the draft should be abolished, and President Nixon followed that recommendation. So obviously that's a big plus for Friedman. Mm -hmm. It's unjust, but it's also economically inefficient, and Friedman explained to a broader public why. But you know, you mentioned the Austrians. I do think Friedman was remarkably ungenerous to the Austrian school. And when there was talk of giving Hayek a mere honorary appointment in Chicago economics, mm -hmm. Friedman opposed it. And I think Friedman was completely wrong there, very close-minded. Hmm. Okay. D d what was his rationale? I don't know. Uh, this is in the historical record. It's in mm -hmm. the Jennifer Burns biography. Mm -hmm. I asked Jennifer about this in my podcast with her. She thought it was simply that, well, Hayek was not scientific enough for Friedman. Mm -hmm. And Friedman, in, vi in my view, did have too much scientism, which a bit he abandons later on when he's a more popular figure, mm -hmm. but he veered a bit too much toward extreme scientism and then extreme popularizer and never quite stopped in the middle at exactly the right point for my taste. Okay. Can you just expound a little bit more, like what specifically was his argument about the military draft just besides saying, hey, you can't force people to go die against their will? What was the like the economic argument is to say why this is a silly or a counterproductive policy? Well, opportunity cost. If you look at nominal numbers in the budget, a draft seems cheaper because you don't have to pay the people very much. But the foregone output, what those people could have done in the private sector, today it would be all these teenagers with startups, right? Uh, the true opportunity cost of the draft is extraordinarily high. And Friedman understood that 110%. Okay, great. So last minute here, uh, can you maybe just tell people if they want to see more of yours, like maybe to talk about your blog or where they should go to follow you or things that you'd like them to know about? Well, you can just Google my name, Tyler Cowen, C-O-W-E-N. My blog is called Marginal Revolution. My podcast, Conversations with Tyler. My YouTube economics education site is mru.org. I'm on Twitter. And again, to get to this book, you can just Google Tyler Cowen Goat, G-O-A-T. Thank you, Bob. Thank you all for listening. 
Okay, thank you, Tyler, for your t- uh, time and contributions and the work you've done on this. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.